that's not a real concern, but I've just noticed in my systems using various mixtures of carbon, of light bottle organic carbons over the years, that when I used a mixed carbon source, I got more effective and more stable results. It's just, I've just seen it in my systems to be, to be more effective. So I would at least consider it. <clears throat> you know, again, if, if, we're, if we're pretty certain it promotes bacterial diversity in a biofilm, is that a good thing? Does that mean that we're getting more nutrient reduction? Um, I think it does. Your mileage may vary. <laughs> this is a, you know, it was one of the earliest mixed source systems being used by uh, reef keepers, a vodka, sugar, vinegar uh, solution. If you're going to try this, I would use glucose um, instead of sugar. Glucose is sold as dextrose or grape sugar in health food stores. And back when I was dosing this stuff, you know, I couldn't find it at Whole Foods. I mean, I had to locate a true hippy dippy Birkenstock wearing <laughs> Indigo Girls playing health food store. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but the community will get that too. Yeah, I'm sorry. The homebrew community will have access to dextrose. Dextrose. Okay. We use it a lot for that home brewing and, uh, and home wine making. You would know. Yes, I would. <laughs> you did not partake of his brew, did you? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of a funny aside. I just told him this. I'll bear my soul here a little bit. Um, I'm an alcoholic. I've been sober for about seven years and, and recovered. So tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor that I'm up here telling you guys about dozen vodka in your tank and I'm a recovered alcoholic. Anyway, um, this is a good starting mixture. Uh, 225 milliliters of vodka to 25 milliliters of vinegar. And then if you're going to use glucose, um, I would only use about a quarter teaspoon, and I wouldn't even use it if you've got a trichophilia or scalenia. For <laughs> what volume? Well, that's just the mixture. I'm ready to get to the dose. Um, we'll get to the dosages in a second, but I want to talk about the. the, the and and I know I'm kind of blowing through this, but I'm going to give you a source where all this is written down. Um, I had much better luck over over a longer period of time is using vodka and ascorbic acid or vitamin C solution in vinegar. Uh, just use buffered vitamin C so it's not too acidic. Uh, I use the Brightwell Aquatics vitamin C supplement and uh, I think I used, I have to look, I think five milliliters to, no, I used 15 milliliters to 225 milliliters of vodka. Um, again, you know, vitamin C, you're gonna notice, you, you may very well notice a, a positive effect on, on zoanthid populations. But the, the, the VCV uh, is just, I, I know I had better results with that over multiple tanks. As an initial dosage of whatever mixed source you do, I recommend 0.1 milliliters per 20 gallons of net, of net water volume of meat, uh, initially for the first three days. So you're talking very small amounts. You want to go really slow. Remember, folks, we are manipulating the basic bacterial populations of the system. We're playing God. Um, and if you do this fast, you're going to have problems. Another thing to keep in mind is <laughs> these bacterial populations and, and these microbes don't only just exist in biofilms grown on the substrate. <laughs> they live on and in the coral tissues themselves and are responsible for mediating a wide variety of uh, uh, biological processes. So when we're changing those types of animals. When we're changing uh, something so fundamental to a coral, uh, there can be real problems if you're doing it too fast. Corals are adaptable, but they're not that adaptable. Uh, I like, getting back to the dosing, um, I like to split mine between an AM and a PM dose. <laughs> Subsequent dosages on days four through seven, you can increase to 0.2 milliliters per 20 gallon, then each subsequent week at about 0.3 to 0.4 milliliters to the dose and, and the important thing is that you're monitoring nutrients you're testing nitrate and phosphate at least twice a week when you start to see them drop then hold that dosage as long as you're continuing to see a drop when you start to see that drop level off then you want to back the dosage back down um, <clears throat> when you get down to where you're you know happy with the nutrient levels um, 
you know, it, it's when you want to consider a maintenance dose, which is about half of your highest dose. I would be real careful exceeding 1.5 milliliters per 20 gallons um, if you're using any kind of sugar or 2 to 2.5 milliliters per 20 gallons if you're not using a sugar. I would just start to, I just, I'm not saying that if you exceed this that bad things are going to happen. This is just a level that I think you need to pay particular attention to. Watch your corals. They'll tell you when they're pissed. <laughs> There's a lot of controversy over bacterial inoculation on the boards, you know, uh, that it's just snake oil and you know, it doesn't really do anything because we've already got such massive populations. And, and you know, I can see both sides of that argument. Based on my experience, it helps. Um, it, it's disputed whether it keeps bacterial populations balanced, but I use it in mine and I recommend it. I've just seen better results inoculating versus not inoculating. Um, there's all kinds of bacterial additives out there. Uh, you know, you want to focus on one that's focused on the heterotrophic strains. Um, I think Prodivio BioDigest, again, is a very good all around inoculant. Um, a lot of people have had good luck with Microbacter 7, which is the Brightwell's product. I haven't personally, but a lot of people have. Zeo back on its own is pretty good. Uh, Julian Sprung Spactivate from Two Little Fishies uh, is, is actually a pretty good general inoculant as well. DIY solids, again, we touched on this briefly. I know we're getting long. I'm trying to get through this. I've seen you know, some people use rice husks or even just rice in a reactor. Um, a lot of problems with rice, high in phosphate, probable fungal development that we don't know what does. You know, at the end of the day, you're going to have uh, cellulose, which in and of itself probably doesn't cause direct problems, but in sufficient con concentrations, who knows? I mean, I know there's giant pools of cellulose floating in the ocean from logging activities. And we're really unsure exactly what effect that's going to have. <clears throat> Showing you some mixed system. This is Ivan Lasser uh, from Switzerland. This is one of his old systems. He was using Prodibio and then an earlier version of the carbon source from Zeovit start to um, you know, just gorgeous tanks. It's in the water over there. Yeah. Well, some of, you know, some of this is it's just what the genetic material sure. or the makeup of the coral is. And for a while, and I, I've heard this, that they've, they don't have this anymore, but for a long time, you were just getting really nice coral colonies imported into Europe, especially Germany. Um, but that being said, this is an example of, of sort of the color range that you're shooting for for some of this. Uh, Sonny Hirajli is a guy from Chicago who does Vodka and Microbacter 7 has a real nice tank. <clears throat> this is an experimental tank I set up to just satisfy my own curiosity as to whether you could have an established and stable reef system with corals with no live rock. Um, obviously, when you introduce corals and fish, you're going to be introducing some bacterial strains. Some bacteria is actually transported through the air, but no live rock, this was all just ceramic rock, and then heavy inoculation of Prodibio and using a vodka sugar vinegar uh, carbon source. And it worked. I got it up and running, and it was somewhat stable. I will say this, it took a long time. It took about six months for it to be really stable. And I, I think with just a limited amount of fish, I was pushing the, the envelope on, on what I could do in terms of livestock loading. But it is possible, I don't recommend it, but it is possible. <coughs> um, so you know, it's a soft coral tank I set up, again using Prodivio and vodka sugar vinegar, uh, had no major problems. This was a uh, Another system using vodka glucose vinegar with Prodibio. A variety of corals. Head stability. This Duresa is about six inches on this photograph three years ago, and it's now 
14 inches. Just bragging a little bit. I like that. Uh, scalemia on a non sugar based mixed carbon source. <laughs> Bacteria is a food source, um, especially with zeolite based systems where you're shaking that reactor, releasing the mum into the system. Um, there are studies that suggest that bacterial plankton, free swimming, free flowing or swimming bacteria, plus bacterial aggregates, which are you know, chunks of biofilm, bacteria embedded in other organic substances, um, are a significant food source for you know, what we consider SPS uh, corals, acroparids, and their allies. <laughs> There's at least one study that showed that. In, in this particular site, 80% of the acropora's nitrogen and carbon budgets were satisfied by bacteria alone. I mean, it was a limited study, but it's kind of interesting. Um, you know, I don't know any other way to generate bacteria other than with a zeolite reactor and carbon does. It's pretty effective for that. As a matter of fact, uh, if you're running, if you collect sponges and are doing a lot of, uh, have a lot of sponges in your system, I wouldn't even think about setting up a zeolite reactor with just a little bit, a small amount of zeolites um, just as a bacterial plankton generator for the sponges. <clears throat> you know, and, and perhaps bacterial supplementation with an increase in the bacterial biomass available to the coral, uh, perhaps you can make up for other nutritional deficiencies. <laughs> Non-photosynthetic systems we're talking about corals that don't use light, azuzanthellate corals. Um, probiotic methodologies may prohibit, may allow us to keep some of these um, in better scenarios than we could without them. Yeah, for one example, Calisponge vaginalis, the, the Caribbean, the large Caribbean base sponge, um, most of its diet is either uh, cyanobacteria or heterotrophic bacteria. So again, sponges, a typical NPS specimen, are a huge bacteria eaters. This is the first stages, initial stages of a non-photo system that I had set up to sort of test whether, how, what all this means, whether you could use, uh, for instance, a zeolite reactor, then I also had bio pellets, a, a heavy carb, uh, bacteria dense system to keep non-photosynthetic corals without having to feed the, the levels of supplementary food that is typically associated with a non-photosynthetic system. So it, this is right when I first set it up. Um, I'll get to skimming in a minute. Let me tell you about my NPS system. I couldn't, I had to feed. Um, in that 130-gallon tank, I finally had to feed, once I had it fully stocked, um, one point four milliliters of rotafeast an hour 24-7 through a syringe pump, along with three massive supplemental feedings of other products. Um, th there was so much food in this water column, I just turned on the light when I wanted to look at it, this tank. Uh, there was so much food in the water column that it changed the surface tension of the water and the skimmer wouldn't work. I mean, I was putting a hundred dollars of food a month in this one non-photo tank. The results were great. I had growth on all my Gorgonians except one. I even had what looked to me, I didn't weigh it, but looked to me to be a pretty healthy and perhaps growing Dendronethia. Um, sponges were crazy. Had a basket star that grew, you know, looks definitely grew from its central disc. Um, I had success. The problem with that tank was, you know, you get up in the morning and go get your first cup of coffee and you walk by the tank and you just go, oh because you knew how much work that tank was going to take and how expensive it was. I mean, it was just a, it was just an outrageous amount of food going into that thing. So, uh, and, you know, when you're, when you're dealing, in terms of nutrient reduction, whether a, a aggressive zeal bit based system could even put a dent in that kind of nutrient load, it could. Skimming, uh, I recommend it on any probiotic system you use. I think export is still important. I don't think it's the full picture. Um, it certainly removes some of the bacteria prior to decomposition. I think that's probably uh, important. And removes 
uh, planktonic bacteria that's matrixed with other stuff floating in the water column. <clears throat> it's, it's, one way to look at it is, is a good skimmer is an effective tool to manage this biomass. You're going to grow this bacterial biomass. It's nice to have some way to make sure it's capped. <clears throat> also, in any carbon dosing system, one major um, risk of overdose, and this applies a lot more to DIY systems than commercial systems, is what's called a whiteout. You're actually going to hit a certain critical mass of the added carbon. You're going to have a massive bacterial bloom. Your um, water column is going to look opaque white. The problem and the danger with that is that all that bacteria in the water column is depleting the water column of oxygen. So it becomes anoxic water, you can kill fish and coral. Um, that level of whiteout, I think, is pretty rare. And I've had sort of minor whiteouts in pushing some of these systems. Um, and haven't, hasn't, have not lost livestock. And boy, the water's really clear after it. But um, just be, skimming helps that. It'll, it'll help with gas exchange. One, it'll take some of the bloom out. And two, it'll keep your oxygen levels up in the event you do have this problem. And skimmers are cool. Yeah. yeah. Bigger the better. Especially like Todd Bashies, you put flames on them. <laughs> GFO, uh, you know, some commercial systems don't recommend it um, because of too rapid of a crash of the phosphate levels. Uh, if you do use it, use it in smaller amounts and flows, just gradually as you go forward. Ozone and UV commercial systems generally don't recommend either. The conventional wisdom is that it will inhabit um, or inhibit bacterial populations. I don't know about, oh, well, ozone certainly, but with UV, uh, I don't think UV is going to put much of a dent in the biofilms growing on substrate, uh, so it's probably okay. There's been some reports of success with it. I would just turn it off if you're dosing bacteria if you've got to run UV. Potassium, we've covered this, can become depleted uh, quickly, especially in uh, zeolite-based methodology. Um, some kit, test kits are available. I'll get more than one and cross-reference. Monty cap, red Monty cap, make sure you've got it if you're running a zeolite-based system. If it starts to fade, get an indicator of potassium uh, completion. And also uh, depletion, and also if you've got faded colors in the crop, or generally it may be a potassium issue. Water changes, you know, you're not using water changes for nutrient reduction. You're using it to maintain and to address uh, minor imbalances in ions. Um, I don't think a water change is a very effective long-term nutrient reduction tool anyway. I mean, it's, it's, it's okay as a short-term fix, uh, but if you don't address import out more, poor, excuse me, input, output, uh, export balances, you're going to be back at the same nutrient levels you were prior. Five to 10% weekly is good. I mean, I'm, I, I generally shoot for 5% a week. If they're well established, you can even drop it down and do less. Amino acid supplementation is, is not really within the scope of this, but if you push some of these systems heavy enough, you're going to have um, potentially low enough nutrient levels to consider adding amino acids, which is a, a I've had real good luck with. Uh, <clears throat> there, there's sufficient documentation of many different species of corals assimilating amino acids directly from water column across their epidermal level, layers. Um, and you can use amino acids if you think you've got nitrogen limitation. I'm going to address this very briefly. Nitrogen limitation is where you've pushed your nutrient reduction system so much that you still have some potassium. You can't get your potassium low, but you're, re you're reading at or near zero on your nitrate test kits. The idea being that you know, now you are nitrogen limited. Your bacteria are not going to grow past that point and bring your phosphates down. Uh, I've only had it in one tank. I've su suspected it in others, but never confirmed it. Um, for the one tank I was sure I had nitrogen limitation on, I added a planted tank uh, nitrogen source. 
uh, was the one made, I'm not a freshwater guy, it's the one made by Sea Kim for planted tanks and it addressed it. I brought my nitrate levels up a little bit and then, and then gradually lowered uh, both nitrate and phosphate. Uh, also that stuff is derived from urea, so maybe another way to do it, you know, if you want to pee in your tank, let me know how that goes. I'm all for experimentation. I've actually done that one, I can tell you. Yeah, intentionally? Yes. <laughs> the thing to remember about carbon dosing, it's just another tool in your toolbox. Um, I've been experimenting with uh, algae scrubbers, a specific type of, of, of scrubber, and, and that's a whole other presentation. Um, I'm noticing some really good synergistic effects between certain sources of organic carbon and algae scrubbers, specifically the long chain uh, polymers. Also polyp lab, um, that seems to be working pretty well together. Uh, and and you know, I don't know if it's the weekly harvesting of the algae off the algae scrubber is the same as uh, uh, shaking the zeolites in a reactor and sharing the biofilms. I don't know if it's an ecological disruption issue. I suspect that the hair algae is a very effective media for growing bacteria. I don't know what's going on there, but something is. Uh, so just remember carbon dosing is a tool and you may find the perfect mix for your tank and use to uh, other filtration method methodologies. Some of the criticisms real quick of carbon dosing is, you know, it's not natural. Well, that doesn't make any sense to me because, you know, bacterial populations in, in our tanks are a mere fraction of what they are on the reef. Uh, there are some studies that suggest that bacteria and associated microbial communities um, are responsible for more nutrient cycling, almost an order of magnitude more than some than algal communities. So, uh, you know, I don't know, once you take these animals off a reef and stick them in a glass box without artificial seawater, the whole it's not natural thing, I think, has already left the door. <laughs> um, another criticism is that, you know, you're increasing population of pathogens. If you're feeding the good bacteria, you got to be feeding the bad bacteria. I, you know, in a well-balanced system, it shouldn't happen. And I don't know of any studies that suggest that's happening. Uh, I guess it's possible. Also increased bacterial metabolites. Bacteria themselves can exude certain compounds that may be noxious to corals. Uh, that's why, I, again, it's a tool in the toolbox. If you're running uh, granular activated carbon, have a skimmer, you, know, you want these things to complement each other. Carbon dressing drawbacks, expensive. I don't know, the Cormix vodka is real cheap. <laughs> Uh, you know, overdose, yes, you can overdose. Uh, it does require diligent attention to parameters, especially if you're doing an aggressive system like a zeolite based system, especially alkalinity and potassium. Uh, it is more time and labor intensive. Uh, if you push them really hard, you can rapidly deplete the, the nutrient level in your tanks. Some final thoughts. Yay. <laughs> Every system has unique populations of bacteria in it. If you did a somehow could magically survey the species, strains, and densities of heterotrophic bacteria in my tank versus your tank versus your tank, you're going to get different results. That impacts what's going to be successful. There is not one size fits all uh, for these methodologies. So you're going to have to experiment and go slow. Monitor your nutrient levels. They're going to tell you what's happening, or it's a good indicator of what's happening in your tank. Go slow. There's the old axiom that nothing good happens quickly in this hobby is never more true than when applying these methodologies. Observe inhabitants, especially corals. They'll tell you if they're happy. Uh, and try and shoot for stable natural saltwater uh, levels. A lot of this is contained in an article that was published a couple of years ago in Coral Magazine. Uh, if you Google probiotics demystified or coral probiotics, it should pull it right up, including my dosage uh, recommendations. <coughs> That's the uh, front cover of that article. A shout out again, Butch mentioned this several times in his presentation, uh, Coral Restoration Foundation, excellent uh, work they're doing. And, uh, 
you know, I, I just can't say enough about these guys. While you know, I think White Tower or Ivory Tower academics were um, you know, talking and publishing papers, Ken Niedermeyer went out and did something. And um, the cool thing about this group, and you guys aren't that far from them. Uh, I don't know what is it, twelve hour drive to the Keys from here. Fourteen. Um, you can actually, with some local dive shops, sign out to go work on these reefs, work on the coral nurseries, help them transplant corals. Uh, it, it, you can get directly involved and be a part of it. 